Let's look at this Aspen simulation here of ammonia reactor design. So this particular simulation was already done in my YouTube video on my YouTube channel. We've already uploaded on it. We've talked about it and I promised to give you guys a detailed reactor design for reactor number two, right? That we are going to look into and explore together. This is a very beautiful, straightforward, detailed simulation that you can check out for yourself. But for the sake of this example, I'm solely going to focus on one equipment and that is this equipment over here which is reactor number two there's already information available for you on my youtube channel in terms of how to simulate everything for the first video here we basically looked at a detailed example of ammonia reacting hydrogen nitrogen that was produced from basically the um, water electrolysis that was produced here once you've checked out both the simulations together you can now look at the final simulation here which is basically a combination of these two simulation one and simulation two. We are going to be designing our reactor. There's some information that I might be leaving out here, like the kinetics of our reactor. That one I feel like is important to do research in terms of literature, what kind of um, catalyst is used, and the catalytic information that can be received or obtained. So let us say that we are dealing with a plug flow reactor over here, and our plug flow reactor happens to be adiabatic, meaning there's multiple tubes inside of our reactor, um, as there will be some heat loss. If our heat exchanger was isothermal, there wouldn't be a need to have multiple tubes. We can just have one large big tube instead of a reactor. So there's three um, equations that are there that I found. The first option that takes into account the volume of a catalyst for one tube of your reactor. If we multiply that one tube by the number of tubes instead of a reactor, you can get an estimate, a rough one of your entire volume of the reactor. The second equation that takes into account the plug flow reactor equation in order to design the volume of your reactor. And lastly, the third option there is the an equation that I also found here. It helps you to calculate the volume of your entire reactor. So let's look at each of every one of the equation that you are looking at here on my screen. Option one, we are going to be sizing the reactor using this equation here. Multiply the number of tubes to get the entire reactor volume. We are going to derive three expressions. These three expressions, once they are solved simultaneously, they can help us calculate the volume of the catalytic reactor for one tube. The first equation is in the form of catalytic weight. The second equation, it's basically the pressure drop inside of our reactor. And lastly, the third equation takes into account the temperature change inside of our plug flow reactor. We will be reacting nitrogen and hydrogen to form ammonia. Let us let nitrogen be expressed in the form of species A. Let us let hydrogen be expressed in the form of species B and ammonia be expressed in the form of species C. Now the rate law expression can also be expressed in the form of parcel pressures. We'll get into it just in a minute. We can also express now the material balance of our entire plug flow system in a form of molar flow balance, which is F. And its units is basically more over time. We know for a plug flow reactor that the rate law expression can be expressed in the form of the inlet species A flow rate multiplied by the conversion, which is X, divided by the change in volume. And the units for this particular rate law expression here, it's mole per time and volume. So if we make V subject of the formula here, we will get FAO expressed in the form of conversion and rate law. We can express our rate law expression in the form of partial pressures with A being species A, B being species B, and C being species C, respectively nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia. We can therefore now relate the partial pressures in a form of its mole fraction multiplied by the total pressure. This can be expressed for species A, species B, and species C, respectively. We can also now further express our molar fraction Ya in a form of Fa and Ft. So this simply means here that fractions Ya can be expressed in a form of Fa, Ft, which is the um, flow rate Fa that's in the product stream divided by the total flow rate that's going out of species A, B, and C. We can do this now, express Y in the form of species A, B, and C. Hence, we have Ya, Yb, and Yc. We can now therefore look into this equation here, which basically say the molar flow rate at which A leaves the system is basically equal to the molar flow rate at which A is fed into the system 
minus the molar fluid at which A is consumed within the system. And this is expressed using this equation over here. We've derived everything in the form of conversion, which can express our FT in a form of conversion as well, which leads us to molar fraction of A also being expressed in the form of conversion. Because remember we said YA is equal to FA over FT. Now we know that FA can be expressed in the form of its conversion. FT can be expressed also in the form of its conversion. We can do this respectively for YB and YC as well. We said the rate law can be expressed in the form of partial pressures. We've derived PA in the form of YA and P. So we can substitute and we've also derived PB in the form of YB and P. We can also further substitute now YA because it was expressed in the form of FA and FT and YB can be expressed in the form of FB and FT. We know that FA can be expressed in the form of conversion, and also FT can be expressed in the form of conversion. So you can do this for B as well. We know that this expression here, yeah, it shows us the rate law in the form of catalytic weight, FAO, and changing conversion. We can make catalytic weight the subject of the formula and substitute RA into this equation here. It will yield this final equation here, which we can call equation one. Because this reaction takes place in a gas phase, pressure drop cannot be neglected. So now we are basically going to substitute everything into this equation here. PR basically expressing the ratio of the total pressure of the product stream versus the inlet pressure of the feed stream. This A here, it is said to be a constant that is used in this in this equation and basically expresses this expression over here with b also being a constant that depends on the bed of the properties of our fluid we can also expand b whereby it's expressed in the form of superficial mass velocity it's also expressed in the form of the initial gas density the diameter of the catalyst of the particle and also viscosity. If we substitute A and B, which are both constant into our pressure equation, we will, it will yield us equation number two. Lastly, because our reactor is adiabatic, we cannot neglect the change in temperature because it won't remain constant. If it was isothermal, we could have neglected the change in temperature just to be one. But now because there is um, a change in temperature within our reactor, we have to take into account. Hence, we have this equation here. This will be our third equation. And it basically takes into account the inlet temperature, the heat of our reaction specific heat capacity of A and also the reference temperature. We managed to derive catalytic weight in a form of conversion. We therefore then derived our pressure drop also in a form of conversion. Lastly, we derived the temperature with change within our system in a form of conversion as well. If we solve all these three equations together simultaneously, we will get the catalytic weight, the pressure, temperature, and the rate of our expression, or also the volume of our reactor. If you're asking yourself, where are we going to get all this information? All we have to do is look at stream number 14. Consider its flow rate, the inlet flow rate of the streams of FAO, FBO, FCO, take into account the temperature that goes into stream number 14, and also the pressure that goes into stream number 14. With that being said, now we can substitute into equation number one. We already know all our parameters. The only unknowns in this equation here, it's the weight of the catalyst, it's the pressure, and also conversion itself. We only know that it ranges between zero and one. If we substitute into our second equation here, we only have two unknowns, which is the catalytic weight and the pressure. Also, my apologies, the temperature, it's unknown as well. So everything else we can substitute should yield the second equation. Lastly, the third equation, we can just substitute everything is known. We know the inlet temperature, we know the specific heat capacity and the, um, the reaction heat at the reference point. I used ODE to help me solve those three equations. I couldn't imagine myself trying to solve them by myself. They are so long, hence we have ODE like octave. So for example, we are going to tell octave for equation one, these are our variables. For equation two, these are our variables and they are answers. Lastly, for equation three, these are our variables.
If we go to the first equation on octave, we can write it in its simplicity. Don't get confused, guys. This is basically the equation that we're looking at in a form of catalytic weight. The second equation was the pressure drop. Don't get confused. It's just basically programming language expressing those equations in a way that Octave can read them. And lastly, the temperature equation. If we solve both equation 1, 2, and 3 simultaneously, tell Octave to display x, p, t, and w, you should get your results at different conversions. So Octave will give you results in this format here, which basically this first line is all the temperatures, hence they're written on this table here at different conversions, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, expressed here. Also, different temperature changes within our reactor at different conversions expressed here. Lastly, the catalytic weight, which remain constant inside of our reactor at 48.59. Now that we have that, we can move forward and calculate the volume of the catalyst for one tube. We can simply take the mass of the catalyst that was calculated using ODE, divide by the density to get our volume. In cubic meters, we can convert it to liters. It's 340.49 liters. Now, there's various ways to get the number of tubes. For this particular example, I just assume there are five tubes within my reactor. And if I multiply this answer here by the number of tubes, I will get a total reactor volume of 11,917 liters. Okay, now let's look at option number two. For option two, we are going to look at this equation here. We know that rate law can be expressed in this equation here. If you make V subjective to formula, you can express it in this equation over here. So we have equation one and two. We also know, or we saw above that, the rate law can be expressed in a form of catalyst. We are going to tell octave between zero and one, the spacing of zero and two, find the different reaction rates at different conversions display your answer for RA, it will give you your answer. Secondly, now that we have our RA at different conversions, we can get our V. So we simply took RA at the conversion of 0 0.2. You can do it for 0 0.4, 0 0.8, and 1, 100% conversion. Write this integral equation here in your programming language. Octave will therefore then give you your answer at that particular rate, your volume ranges between 283 liters and 1.4 liters. Now, the third equation, the third option that one might want to consider. I got this one from literature. And it basically takes into account the length of the tube, also the diameter of the shell. So to calculate the number of tubes, we are basically going to take into account the diameter of the tube, which can be assumed to be 0 0.15 meters, the length of the tube, which can be assumed to be 4.88 using the Toller and Sinot textbook, and lastly, the density of our catalyst given to be 1,200 kilograms per meter cubed. If you subject everything, you should get the number of tubes within your reactor to be estimated 103 tubes. The shell diameter. We are going to take into account the diameter of the tube, also the number of tubes, and also this expression here, which is called the performance fraction. You can calculate it manually. I got my to be 0 0.67. I found the diameter of my shell to be 1.86 meters. Now, lastly, let us get the volume of our reactor. So for the volume of our reactor, we are first going to get the total length of the reactor, which is approximately found to be by adding the length of the tubes and the diameter of the shell. If you add everything together, you get 6.74 meters. We can therefore now calculate the volume of our reactor. If we substitute everything, you should get at least 10,752 liters. By looking at everything here, for option two, 
we got the smallest reactor volume at only 1,412 liters versus option one, which gave us 11,000 liters, and option two, which gave us 10,000 liters. One might want to really look into the second equation and see where did we go wrong. But overall, yes, there's really many ways, guys, to calculate the volume of your reactor. I really hope this information can be helpful in terms of calculating your volume of your reactor. Don't forget to also do your own research by looking at different textbooks such as reactor design textbooks or um, plant design textbooks that can really, really help you to calculate all this information that you might need when you're sizing your own reactor. There's a lot that goes into the reactor, guys. We could have also simply used Aspen to size our reactor and it could have shown us at different conversions, the different lengths within our reactor and also given us the residence time, which could have also helped us to calculate the volume of our reactor. So there's really, really that goes on to these things, guys. I was just showing you guys how I would go about it. Thank you so much for watching. Till next time. Bye.